morning, everybody. Good morning. This is a pleasure. It's a pleasure to present this webinar today. In the current material scenario, the results that we are going to present are an interesting alternative for new application industry, such as abrasion and wear. In this webinar, the rules that we will follow are the following. Firstly, there will be three presentations of about 20 minutes each. Secondly, a question time, about 30 minutes. During presentations, the microphones will be turned off. At the end of the end, we will turn on. From Tecnalia, thank you. We start. Our first speaker is Dr. Ivan Vicario. He is graduated in mechanical and material engineer and doctor in chemistry of condensated material by the University of Bordeaux. Worked at Technalia since 2005. He is the project leader together with Dr. Patricia Caballero, who is now who moderates the session. We will start talking about selection of allowing and reinforcing elements experiments at large scale. Please, Dr. Ivan Vicario, is your time. Uh, good morning at, at all. Uh, we are going to start with this webinar, the development of new steel grade. It comes from European project uh, HSPDC. Still, and um, okay, here we have the, the agenda that it has uh, still before Patricia. The project uh, has four uh, partners the Tenali is the coordinator. We have also uh, uh, the Barrio Romania, that is the die maker, SWG, that is the steel maker, and UEA SPA, that is the hypersode caster of this project. So we have the complete uh, uh, the complete row of the, all the all the process. So if we go ahead, we can have the, the goal. The goal is to develop a new state grade with improved uh, properties that can improve the mechanical, thermal, and technical properties with the scope of increasing productivity and in optimizing the process parameter, but, but the most important one to increase the life of the of the steel. Current dice suffers for thermal stresses and they have a limited uh, life because of the hypersource temperatures and the chemical attack of the aluminium or the magnesium over the die. So which one is the, the strategy of this project? And we are uh, focusing on trying to introduce carbides into the uh, steel matrix, but we know that normally if we introduce these carbides, they can be not well distributed, uh, they can be agglomerated, they can give brightness to the material. So we think about the pos possibility of introducing a master alloy, where in the master, this master alloy, they are an iron that covers uh, titanium molybdenum carbides. When we introduce this iron with this uh, distributed titanium molybdenum carbides into the steel, we can have a good dissolution of these uh, carbides because they are probably wetting with the iron. So this is the concept. We have made many trials and many projects all over the years. And uh, the, one of the key points is how to produce this master alloy. So we uh, have been working with the sulfur operating high temperature synthesis process, the SH process, where we make a mixture of different powders uh, that they can be the uh, pure metals, so they can be, for example, ferro alloys. And after with these powers, we compact and we, with an electric discharge, we make a self providing reaction where we obtain a matrix that in this case is the weight area with round keramics that are the keramics that we want to add to our alloy. So, in the project, what do we want to do? In one way, we must define which one is the alloy, 
with some the different reinforcement percentage of the this master alloy, and we have selected the H11 steel alloy as the base material to do that. So based on this selection, we make the Taguchi design of experiments uh, with the selection of the different uh, alloying elements, the different levels of the alloying elements, and also the different levels of the percentage of master alloy that we want to employ in the project. In this case, we change, for example, the master alloy from 0% up to uh, 9%, or the chromium can variate from 1 to 5.5% in weight. So once we have defined which can are the alloys and which one are the, the, the compositions that we want to study, we have defined which can be the way that we measure and we study at the laboratory scale and after in the industrial scale to test this material. So in one way, we have the thermal fatigue that is the, the nine more or less the 80% of the of the cracks in the in the dice are uh, related with the thermal fatigue. So in Ternalia, we have a machine to try to simulate the behavior of the thermal fatigue by heating by this induction some test bars from 200 to 650 degrees in a continuous cycle with different test bars. We can uh, make a simulation of how a core is working in a die. Another by magnetic particles, we might make a comparison between different materials, different the, uh, thermal treatments, different surface treatment to evaluate how they work in the reality in, in the laboratory scale. We focus on the determination of 24 alloys from the matrix uh, uh, Taguchi matrix to select three alloys and to make a final alloy at the industrial scale. So semi-industrial tests with 400 kilograms are uh, the last laboratory test that we uh, made. And we also wanted to determine the workability of this material because this is a uh, high uh, premium steel. They are uh, normally uh, made by uh, an ESR process, which is going to be uh, explained but also 3D for it. So we wanted to determine which were the parameters that we must employ in the 3D uh, forging of these steams. We also uh, have the, in mind the internal stress because uh, with, when we add ceramic particles to a uh, steel, we can increase the internal stress of this steel. So we have a volumeter that it can be employed to determine this internal stress. And after the final trials with the time uh, with the still made at SWG, with the time made at Levario, uh, they are going to be and they are done in this moment at Dua Spa. So which one is the this project it was uh, divided in different work packages. So the with the first one it was the steel requirements and then the process specification with the uh, current diagnostics. So we received uh, several dice from Fondelli from Duea and we analyzed which are the common and uh, wearing and, and use uh, cracks that they are created in the uh, high pressure die casting dice. So we determined, we determined which were the problems, which were the main uh, areas with the uh, with the every and every area with kind of uh, abrasion or cracking uh, then uh, we have for type of cracking. We put a uh, target mechanical properties for the base alloy and the reinforced alloy. We can check here that we increase the mechanical properties, the ultimate tensile strength and gear strength values, because normally if we were at uh, ceramic particles, we increase this uh, mechanical part, uh, mechanical properties, but with decrease elongation. That is the key point of the reinforcing materials with ceramics. So, because of the previous works, we know also that we need a um, very small uh, cargo size of about five microns, and we also know that a machine can be 
uh, problems with the wearing uh, of the tools and the reduction in the uh, machining parameters. So we have a maximum of 30% of increasing the price of the machining uh, and die costs in order to try to make a, a material that it can be employed in the in the in the market. So we have also an objective of about a 50% of increase of the life of the die. We also perform uh, an MRI metal and cost impact uh, study, an LCC and LCA study, in order to compare in theory what we wanted to obtain, and we see that we can obtain a good reduction of environmental uh, impacts and also on uh, and also in the economical aspects with a 23 of estimated cost reduction. So these were the starting points to deliver the project. We start with the dial steel design and about the scale sample production. So we have here the 24 alloys that we set uh, when the matrix uh, Taguchi matrix was done. It was also based in the in simulation. We have a project of Gima Pro and Thermocal in the project to determine the composition of the stable phases, the temperatures, and so on. And we also developed the self regulating high temperature synthesis. In this point, we start with a small batches of about one kilogram, and we go for five kilogram. This is master alloy that it was made at atmospheric uh, conditions not in the in, in a reactor and we also uh, were capable of working with ferroloids instead of working with pure materials as titanium or chromium so or molybdenum excuse me so here we can see for example uh, here uh, this area the white area is the iron uh, area and this other is the where there are the carbides here we see the master alloy millet, and here how we are how have obtained the five kilograms master alloy. We have a pilot plan uh, at Tenalia where we prepare some dies with a specific part uh, design. Um, but first of all, we have made a first trials to determine we can be the maximum. Uh, Master alloy that we can introduce into the steel because we know that it was about around six eight percent. We made trials and we determined also that uh, it was a maximum of about 4.5 percent of master alloy that we can add for the uh, uh, steel. Uh, so we casted the 24 alloy, we obtained the test marks, and here we have the alloy composition. Uh, we can check that uh, here we have decreased from 8% uh, of in weight of master alloy for up to 6% uh, in theory. And uh, from this uh, material, we make the complete characterization of all. So we start with, uh, with a standard decision, but in order to make a comparison of properties or mechanical properties, we have decided to employ the same thermal treatment to the 24 alloys. So we establish, uh, based on NAFCA recommendations, a normalizing temperature of about 980 degrees, a quenching temperature of 1030 degrees is a little lighter, uh, higher than uh, the standard one, but we wanted to increase the sternization of the alloy. And a tempering temperature of 550, 600, and 550 degrees. So, this was something to be comparable to all the 25 alloys. So, here we have some of the test bars, minimum three test bars were employed. And from all this, we obtain a formula where we have an estimation of all the properties in. A Function of the composition of the alloy. So, in the uh, range of alloying elements that we employ for the uh, matrix design, uh, and with this, uh, the obtaining results, applying 
multiple regression formulas, we obtain some formulas. But what the main uh, thing that we have from this it was that the regression coefficients was very, very high. It was about 0 0.9, uh, 9, 0 0.76, always in elongation, they are smaller. Uh, our resilience also we have very good uh, values. We have uh, avoid the, all the formula because we think they are sensible for the project and for the uh, die manufacturer. And in the case of uh, harness, it was near one that it will be the perfect uh, regression. Uh, from this, we also wanted to know what happened with the microstructure, if they were a good uh, mantle side the structure or, or not. So in some of the cases, we have a very good uh, Martin said, uh, I will distribute the retainment as tonight. But uh, we see also in some of them, and many cases, it was not a good complete abstinization of the of, of the steel. So we defined that we went to increase from 1030 uh, degrees to 1050 degrees in order to have the quenching process and to try to austenize uh, all, the, all the matrix. We define three alloying elements, uh, three alloying alloys from these experiments. Uh, we can see what the, the, we change the alloying uh, percentage of return alloy from zero till four. And also other alloying elements we uh, modify from 5.5, 3.5 and 2 in the chromium, for example. But we work with a combination Perhaps uh, in this case, for one uh, percent of master oil, which one was the most, uh, the most or the better uh, combination in chromium and other alloying elements. So, in parallel, we wanted to decrease also and to improve the uh, master alloy to decrease the carbides. So we work in in development more or finer uh, alloying uh, carbide carbon. And we also have to define the quenching and tempering temperature because as much as they are uh, uh, samples or alloys that they can have synthetic carbides, we don't know exactly which one are the uh, quenching and tempering uh, temperature. So we uh, have a normalizing uh, temperature of 1,000 degrees, a quenching temperature of 1,050 degrees, and Tempering cycles that with different uh, temperature from 570 degrees up to 630 degrees maximum tempering temperatures. So we produce in the laboratory tests, we make the chemical compositions and we observe that the obtaining compositions they were very similar to the ones that we wanted. So also uh, for the machining, we wanted to uh, have less than five microns in the carbon size and with the STC uh, OG3 for a maximum of 20% in decrease on the, on the cost. So here we make some different trials of machining, uh, including electrodes discharge machining, uh, milling, laughing, so obtaining different uh, prototypes and parts are like in these ones. So in this, what we see is that the, the, we, we saw some difficulties in sewing some of the parts, but it was a quite similar process to obtain the, part, the, the parts uh, in the machine operations. And also in the welding operation, it was quite good the welding properties. So we are going after you uh, to go more in detail on the, all these uh, properties. And we also make uh, an elision of the alloy to make the, the uh, all the trials. And we saw, and we are going to more more in detail with alloy number two. That is the one that we have one percent of uh, of uh, reinforcing uh, master alloy. Here we can see uh, after tension and tempering, which one was the structure. We can see the small carbides inside the brains and the grains. Of the steel grains, also the grain boundaries and sign carbides over the grain boundaries. So this objective of having a small synthetic carbides into the grain uh, signs it was a good sign. So after the heat treatments, we have an untempered mantle site. So uh, it was not complete uh, 
temperate molten site. We have also some very small, well distributed carbides, synthetic carbides. So, in conclusion of the first 15 minutes, we want we had to work more in this in this uh, thermal treatments, but we see a good distribution of the synthetic carbides. So we had to make also pin on this uh, essays at 300 degrees and 500 degrees in order to check what happens with the three alloys and the different thermal treatments. We make the general display results here, the pin were results. But uh, as a result, we have that the, the alloy with the results in carbides with master alloy, they have the worst behavior. The three uh, alloy that it has the highest uh, master alloy have uh, the better, the better uh, uh, properties, but not always. So there was not a clear difference with, uh, between alloy with a 1% of master alloy and a 4% of master alloy. So uh, we see that there was a, an, a, an increase in the, in the wearing, but it was not so determining the percentage of the after the 1% having a 4% it was not so determinating. So after we have also the, the mechanical properties, we can see here the ultimate tensile strength for A1 is the one without a master alloy, A2 with a 1% and A3 with a, a 4% different temperatures. Um, and we can see here that we have low elongation values, good year strength and ultimate intensity strength uh, elongation values. And, but this is uh, related what the, with the, these trials were done at Nalia with a semi semi-industrial uh, process. And we don't employ 3D for job forging. So we think that these values were good enough after for the industrial validation of the alloy. So we uh, check and we uh, select the alloy number two with 1% of of the first master alloy. We define here also the, re the resilience, good resilience, with a total uh, fracture uh, of the test bars. And uh, in the characterization, but the optical and, uh, and uh, uh, electrical uh, microscope, we also really create a very good distribution of the master alloy with the uh, iron. Uh, matrix and the molybdenum and titanium with a core um, with more machete and uh, with we have an, uh, as, uh, an estimate uh, diameter of three microns with a good distribution from 0 0.5 to 5 uh, micros in the SHS master alloy. And also we have Morning, then in the surface of these particles, so it is good for the good waterability of synthetic carbides in the modern steam. Here we have uh, some in, uh, same image with the distribution of the steel. We have the steel here. The, we have the vanadium, the molybdenum, and the titanium. And the hardness of the forest uh, the, of the three steel also were tested. And we see here that alloy hard to have a very high hardness after the, the normalizing. After third treatment, third treatment, we have also quite uh, high uh, hardnesses, but uh, we should check for uh, an ideal thermal treatment. We make also a forging test in, in uh, an external uh, supply of, of Ternalian. We see that. Uh, there was difference between the three materials. The better one it was the one without a, a master alloy. The one with 1% 1 of a reinforcing master alloy it was also good deformation. And the smaller foreign behavior was with the alloy number three that it was the one with higher percentage of master alloy. We make also the atomic test tests to determine it. And what we observed was that uh, it was not a total martensite uh, uh, transformation. It was also a transformation uh, at about 750 degrees for, from carbides. We check it with thermocal and with an equilibrium and non equilibrium 
uh, conditions and the results were, were very quite similar and uh, with the, the automatic uh, process uh, test. We also check the resilient stress test. Uh, alloy, uh, all the alloys have the uh, very uh, uh, similar and low residual stresses. The third one it has a slightly higher, but a uh, uh, good, uh, good thing that they were uh, compression stress. So here we have the results. In thermal fatigue, we check the three materials and we observe very small cracks after 100,000 uh, cycles. So this was also a good signal. And we make a sand test with the Kiebel machine in order to determine uh, at different strain rates and different temperatures which one was the behavior of the material. So here we have all the tests. You can see different temperature from 800 degrees till 1,250 degrees, different uh, velocities, 0.5 till uh, 10 seconds uh, speed. And we determined that there were a range of temperatures and a range of, uh, of reduction where we can work properly with these alloys. So, we analyze the, the fracture of the tensile samples. We saw a lot of uh, particle plasticity because of the, it was a, an intercrystalline fracture, but it is uh, also uh, connected with the presence of brittle carbides that they reduce the plasticity. So we see and we determine which one was the uh, the work ability in the, uh, of these steels in, for 3D forging, it was a good way, a wide window of, from 920 degrees till 1,150 uh, degrees. And as conclusions, uh, we have obtained and we have we think that they, this will, will, will work on the industrial scale. So now, it is going to be the moment for the presentation of the from the next uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Vicario, from your very descriptive presentation. Now, our second. Now, our second speaker is Tobia Darbesten. Tobia Darbesten, Mr. Darbesten, is metallurgist at Institute of Ion and Steel Technology since 2017. He's working at SWG and currently she is working at Quality Department. He is going to present an electric lab remelting study at lab scale and the manufacturing industrial process. Please, Mr. Tobias, this is time. Okay, so. So good morning uh, to everybody. So I'm going now to present the uh, progress of the project, um, <clears throat> the work package number four industrial scale manufacturing of um, ESI ingot with HS, HSS uh, alloy. Uh, to produce the master alloy for the industrial casting of the new tool steel grade, uh, we had beforehand, we had to um, develop a new feeding or strategy how to implement or to add the SHS alloy at industrial ESR scale. So big questioning mark over there. That's why first uh, we started uh, to analyze the dissolution uh, behavior of um, of master alloy in uh, steel and in uh, slag samples. <clears throat> it has been necessary to perform specific tests to identify and test the addition strategies in the ESR process. And uh, for this, we had the strong cooperation with University of Freiburg, um, therefore Iron and Steel, Institute of Iron and Steel Technology. So there they have um, ESR, um, 
they have a small ESR available on laboratory level where some uh, pre-trials have been performed. And by this, uh, later on after the solution, like preliminary tests for estimating the solution behavior have been also done at the hot, inside the hot stage microscope. Here you can see now uh, some results of uh, steel and master alloy. So on the top left picture, you see there is um, an alumina sample on the bottom. Then there is a steel sample of H11 grade, and then on top there is master alloy. And therefore we could prove that master alloy above um, almost approximately at uh, 1480 degrees C. So there is a dissolution. Um, given in between master alloy and the steel sample and uh, further on also what we could see here is uh, the solution or like is the um, reactivity in between the slag and the master alloy. So we could prove uh, both facts that in both cases master alloy and was well dissolved into the slag and in the steel matrix which was uh, very important for us to understand beforehand not to expect any phase separation during um, master alloy feeding at the electric um, slag remitting process. Further on what you can see here it was very important for us to understand how to at the master alloy at an ESR plant on industrial scale. And for this, uh, we had uh, we developed two ideas. One idea could have been to drill holes into the electrode. You see here, this is a sample of a rectangular electrode, uh, which we have used uh, for laboratory based experiments. So in these uh, drilled holes, we have fed this uh, master alloy. And also what we also have performed was another method of uh, feeding the master alloy using ceramic lenses and to feed the master alloy by a continuous feeding system into the liquid slag pool at ESR melting. And over this uh, to have then finally a dissolution into the steel matrix. So we have tried several tests at the Institute of Iron and Steel Techno Technology. So the first test was, was aborted because of some uh, instabilities. The second test was about the drilled holes. We had the block section or we had finally we got the block section of um, eight kilogram and uh, the carbide um, or let's say the master alloy uh, feeding was um, almost 130 grams. The third test was feeding and also like feeding system implemented for one part of the uh, of the ESR ingot and uh, the other part was with the drilled holes. We also implemented approxim approximately 130 grams and then <clears throat> the fourth test was again uh, in a combination in between feeding and drilling. However, we, I have to say that the test number two and test number three, they have been more or less um, successful successfully. So here you can see some samples of um, <clears throat> ESR ingots on laboratory scale. Um, this is a reference sample how an ingot looks like. So the diameter is um, 80 millimeters. And here this is test sample number. This is the second test sample like hereby like the um, as you have seen here master alloy has been implemented by the drilled holes and uh, over this test number three, we had the uh, section wide. So first we had the base steel. So the electrode uh, was untouched. We have not changed anything. Then we had part of the electrode uh, where we have um, fed or the uh, master alloy by a blowing procedure using the ceramic tubes. And then on the third zone, you can see here, we had the like carbides inserted uh, by the drilled holes over the electrode. Finally, the blocks obtained in the tests were analyzed and uh, like we got an analysis um, over edge transition and core zones. What we can, what we got finally, we got an understanding that there's a um, increase of the carbon concentration in between uh, um, <clears throat> test two, three and four in comparison to the initial composition. So the initial composition has been 0.38% of carbon 
1.3% uh, of the molybdenum and uh, 0.004 percentage of the titanium. And uh, by the two, by this uh, following test, actually, we got an increase of the carbon concentration of the molybdenum concentration and the titanium content. So we have to summarize over here that uh, it is possible that the carbide enrichment is possible by both um, feeding methods. Uh, we have also um, summarized that there's an equal distribution of carbides over the cross section. Carbides mainly at the grain boundaries we found at uh, optical uh, microscopy analysis and also SEM. However, this is a strong process parameter modification for a standard ESR process because we impact the uh, um, liquid slack. We have an impact on the liquid slack pool. And um, so that's why it is the laboratory scale experiments. They are not one to one comparable to an industrial scale melting. A summary given by the pre studies as following that uh, finally we understood that uh, drilling holes into a very large industrial scale electrode is not feasible. So that's why finally we implemented a feeding system in our ESR plant at uh, SWG on industrial scale. What you can see here is our ESR ingot after remelting and feeding the master alloy. So finally, we produced an industrial scale alloy, uh, industrial scale ESR ingot with a <clears throat> average the weight has been approximately 18 tons. And there, during the processing of uh, in the ESR plant, we had the continuous feeding of master alloy. So we had the initial composition of the master alloy was at um, before starting the ESR process. So there was kind of premix mixture given on the bottom on the core plate of in, in um, on the crucible of the ESR plant. And then we had the continuous feeding, constant feeding by 30 grams per minute of uh, master alloy doing ESR remitting. So you can see here, this is a result from the plant. Uh, we analyzed also the uh, slag composition. And you can see here, this is analysis of uh, slag composition um, on the left uh, axis on, on the right axis. And in the bottom down axis on the X axis, we have the ESR ingot mass. So we have um, here, what you can see here that uh, the gray line is the uh, calcium fluoride line. So we have, we see here, we have a slight decrease of the calcium fluoride over the remelting process, which is more or less um, known for an open ESR plant, which is given here at SWG. Then we have the, yellow line that we have an impact on the silica level. And um, then the alumina concentration and the uh, lime concentration, they have been more or less constant. And what we can see here is almost a linear increase of the titanium oxide concentration of the slag over the ESI ingot mass. So that's why we came to the conclusion that uh, not, every, not uh, the whole master alloy um, was finally um, <clears throat> add to the liquid steel pool. So there has been more, or less, there, there have been some reactions with uh, titanium. So either it has been uh, based off um, ferrotitanium or it was uh, so not, uh, it was not, not bonded titanium with carbon. So the titanium did react with the oxygen present at our ESR plant and we formed titanium oxides. But the rest of the uh, master alloy has been uh, fully, um, was fully, how to say this, recovered during the remelting. And what we can see here is like a comparison in between the titanium concentration of samples we have taken during the remelting process as a function of the ESR ingot mass. And also what we can see here again is the titanium oxide concentration of the slag pool as a function of ESR ingot mass. And what we can see here, there was a very stable recovery rate um, of the titanium during the remelting process. So this is a, these are very good results because it means that our feeding was um, stable during the whole 
ESA in God Mass uh, um, remelting. So to summarize here, uh, we have to say that some of the titanium is, is burned in the ESR process. So we can see here that the final yield of alloying element um, from a master alloy, in this case titanium, the recovery rate was approximately 40 percentage. Molybdenum recovery rate was uh, almost 100 percentage and the carbon recovery rate was also 94 percentage. So this st study shows that with an approximative average master alloy composition, um, molybdenum and carbon are nearly perfectly dissolved in a steel alloy. So here I'm at the end of my presentation and then I will hand over the presentation to my colleague. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Darberston, Darberstein, for your very interesting presentation. Because we know perfectly how important and difficult is pass to the lab scale to industrial scale, and in this case, have been success. Thank you so much for your presentation. Our third speaker is Alexander Hanks. He has manufacturing education at Dresden since 2013, working at SWG, and he's the product manager. He is going to present the machining and property results of the new steel that we have been develop, developed in this PDC Steel European project. Please, Mr. Heinz, it's your time. Thank you. Okay, hello also from my side. My name is Alexander Hengst and I will go on with the next steps in industrial production and uh, will present to you also the subsequent material properties which we, which were the result. Um, prior to the forging, the ESR ingot was diffusion and yield uh, in order to uh, put uh, microsegregation levels at the minimum level. The first step of the actual forging process was a full upsetting as it can be seen on the left bottom picture in our 6000 tons um, open die forging press. After upsetting a stretch forging process followed which was performed in uh, several heats and it can clearly be seen that only looking at the stretch forging process we were able to uh, obtain a forging ratio of 5.6 for this uh, forged tool steel bar with a rectangular square or re rectangular square section. And this high forging ratio is the key in order to uh, close 100% of the porosities which uh, came from the former ESR, possibly came from the former ESR ingot. Additionally, uh, it is the key in order to produce a very fine grain and homogene microstructure by recrystallization process during the forging. And finally, by uh, forming in all three dimensions, we are able to obtain a tool steel, a hot work tool steel with uh, nearly isotropic properties. Subsequent to the forging process, an annealing process followed. This process is a special annealing process called EFS, Extra Fine Structure Annealing Process. This is a multi-step annealing process uh, to ensure an annealed structure in delivery condition uh, with a very fine grain and a homo homogeneous uh, appearance. Additionally, the homogeneous homogene annealing structure sets the basis for a later uniform and fine grained microstructure in hardened and tempered condition after vacuum heat treatment of the later dye. And at exactly at this point, already the base is set for a prolonged dye lifetime. The forged and uh, 
annealed block was um, ultrasonic tested and fulfilled the requirements EE according to SEP 1921. And on the bottom of this slide, we can see microstructure pictures in different enlargements, 50 to 1 as well as 500 to 1. And it, is, it can clearly be seen that um, as well on the block bottom as well as on the block top in the core precision, um, the obtained annealed microstructure in enlargement 500 to 1 clearly fulfills uh, the typical requirements of national and international annealing structure standards. Uh, additionally, on the bottom pictures, uh, we find the typical reinforced synthetic carbides, um, which originate here from the master alloy in this project. And this is the main idea of the HPDC steel project. Um, these small primary or not, uh, these small project carbides are normally distributed uh, and locally can be found in small accumulations. If we look at um, micro, if, if we look at examination pictures from micro homogeneity, uh, where which are shown in uh, enlargement 50 to 1, we can see under additional application, that means a uh, higher etching effect, we can see these carbides again in these pictures visible as white spots or white dots. Um, these reinforced synthetic carbides increase uh, towards the core uh, as well as in the accumulation or size and also in the number. A typical uh, number in size of the carbides is around 10 to 20 micrometers. The forged tool steel block was uh, saw cut into smaller pieces in order to perfectly fit the dimensional requirements of the uh, later die, die parts which were manufactured. Of course, at uh, Spiedewerke Krödez also uh, smaller pieces for laboratory examination were taken. And um, the hardness after the EFS annealing uh, was measured at 210 and we can see a 210 hardness Brunel and we can see on the bottom pictures that as well for the top uh, part of the block and then the bottom part of the block that we find a homogeneous annealing hardness from the surface to the core part. Additionally, the micro cleanliness level was examined according to the standard ASTM E45 method A, but also according to DEAN 5602 method M. In both cases, uh, the severity levels of the non-metallic inclusion contents are acceptable and the maximum allowable limits of uh, microcleanliness confirm to the uh, well-known national and international standards for hot work tool steels and die casting applications. Um, an important note is that for uh, these kind of microcleanliness uh, micro examinations for this HPDC steel is that uh, it has to be clearly differentiated uh, during the examination between actual non-metallic inclusions and also the project typical synthetic carbides um, in order to obtain a real convincing and real uh, result for the microcleanliness. In any case, the typical uh, requirements on ESR remelted hot work tool steels are met and uh, we do not expect any negative impact uh, by the microcleanliness for the ongoing uh, application. Uh, we do not expect that any non-metallic inclusions could work as uh, possible micro crack starters. In this picture, we can see the grain size, which was determined according to ASTM E112 in hardened and tempered condition. Uh, and uh, by result of the um, forging process uh, with a high forging ratio, the uh, grain size was determined according to 
ASTM with number eight. Um, a typical reference uh, is that or requirement is that predominantly ASTM number seven is required. We have achieved this requirement and even uh, our final result is a little bit above this requirement. So this is also the basis uh, for mechanical properties of the steel, which finally determine the die life of the die steel and of the die casting in the final application. So all these um, metallographic results, all these properties uh, must bring around uh, mechanical properties, for instance, the toughness, uh, resilience tests were made uh, in this case for char PV notched samples, but also for unnotched samples. And um, as well on the block top, as well as uh, on the block bottom uh, in the core part, but also halfway between surface and core. And um, Excuse me. Um, we can see that uh, we can see the single uh, Charpy V notch samples on the top of the slide, but also we can see the uh, unnotched impact sample tests on the bottom of the slide. And the unnotched samples uh, with uh, the, the averages, but also the single values fulfill the demands for uh, yeah, sophisticated applications. Um, we also show the heat treatment, laboratory heat treatment of these samples, which were basically, uh, which were put through a, a simulated heat treatment. Um, and it has to be said that uh, the quenching was performed uh, in, on moving air. Uh, this has to be recognized. Um, another option would be to quench, uh, especially char PV notch samples uh, by oil, which uh, according to our experience, will even bring a higher toughness results. Um, but overall, uh, these results of uh, resilience confirm the uh, before made simulations, uh, confirm them at industrial scale. We are very satisfied with uh, these kind of results. And uh, uh, in any case, we understand that um, the material is by its resilience and its toughness is able to prevent micro cracks from growing. Finally, um, I know laboratory uh, results are one side, but of course, especially in this project, the relevant or the most relevant reference in any case is the performance of the die steel in the final application. Uh, until today, there have been no problems reported from, from uh, current application trials in the die casting, uh, especially or exactly the industrial application is bringing around very good, uh, very good results so far, in fact. So at this point, um, Iban, I would like to pass the word to you to go on with the presentation. Thank you. Yes, I, I, want, I, I would like to say thank you, Alessandra Heinz, Mr. Alessandra Heinz, for your interesting presentation and say, because you described very well the, all the characteristics and results at industrial scale. Thank you so much. So now we will continue with Ivan, Dr. Ivan Vicario, please, talking about quality and zones that manufacturing at industrial scale. Thank you. Ivan, open the microphone, please. Excuse me. So, uh, what I was uh, talking is that uh, uh, they were not showing problems. Uh, we check again dynamometry studies. Uh, we check that the uh, uh, results were, were very, very similar to the previous one with the uh, Martin Sintas quality of North Finis. So, we make again some uh, simulation with Thermocal and with uh, Gemma Pro. The only difference that we saw is that Gemma Pro 
was not capable of predicting the presence or retaining dust the night at room temperature. We uh, had to define the, the thermal treatment. This was a key point because uh, we, we don't we know nothing about that. We know it was very important to to define the temperatures and times and, and so on, but we must make that. So we put uh, three different quenching temperatures, 1,030 uh, degrees, uh, 1,050 and 1,090. Uh, and uh, also it was the process from I mean from uh, SWD that we have seen before, what, where we have uh, about uh, 200 uh, Brinell harness uh, obtained from this annealing process. And uh, when we go ahead, uh, also the results from from the quenching process, uh, the very process that it has uh, followed uh, Alice before. So, what we did again was uh, trying to define a process very similar to NAPCAN standards with higher uh, temperatures. We see here the Quenching temperatures, the tempering temperatures from 580 degrees till 660 degrees. So we make all these trials in order to make and to, to test the properties. And what we had said was the main first results were uh, surprisingly, the higher hardness we don't get with the maximum percentage of uh, reinforces element that it was, uh, or, or temperature that was. Uh, 1,090 degrees, but we get with uh, 1,050 degrees, and uh, we think that it was it, it could be created with a, a different grand size for some dissolution of compounds into the matrix. So we also see here that we have also a kind of uh, of area between uh, around 45 uh, uh, rowers C harness that it was the, the area when we wanted to work. So we define these treatments. What we make is after we analyze the, the temperature and the, the, uh, at 1050 degrees, and we see the presence of precipitated carbides, also the thin synthetic carbides that are different. We see that this uh, precipitated carbides are more in the green boundaries and the synthetic carbides normally they are some in the brown uh, in the green boundaries but normally in the uh, in, inside the green and some retained dust night also was discovered in this analysis. So we measure the the green size of the uh, three quenching temperatures and uh, we obtain that uh, the higher the temperature the smaller the green size. So that was a little uh, against the the properties, the harness that we have obtained before. So we make also that to, we try to test what ha what happened with the Kimacro simulation of the tempering and quenching processes. We see that the the values were lower than the real test. It can be also related that they, they don't have into account the reinforcing uh, matrix. And after also we see that uh, uh, in the case of uh, 1,090 degrees, it were, there were some coarse temperament inside structure. So we think that that was the case that uh, because of the solution of some of the carbides, we have a decreased hardness from the final quenched uh, samples. So with these results, we determine that the quenching temperature will be 100 and 50 degrees, but we wanted to test uh, the temperatures in this interval that we had uh, seen before. So we defined an interval from 600 till 650 degrees in order to check the tempering process. We made the tempering process and we, we have these results. Increasing the uh, tempering temperature, we decrease the hardness. So we have Harness values from 50, uh, 1 uh, till 41 uh, row LC values. So, if we wanted to work in this uh, around 45 degrees, we had to select the R7 or R8 uh, thermal treatment. 
we check what, what, what was the, the distribution and the elaboration uh, of the particles also in this case. And we check uh, which one was also the elongation, gear strength and ultimate tensile strength value. So we check, we can see here how if we increase the temperature, we promote an increase on the gear strength and ultimate tensile strength values, but we increase the elongation. So we get good elongation values up to 14% of elongation in this in this uh, in these values. So after we has uh, a point that the best working area was this area. So for example, we have had an eight percent for R7 temper uh, uh, process. The same with the impact uh, and resilient uh, test. We wanted to know what happens with the resilience and uh, and we make the same, the same test and we check that we have quite good values of uh, of impact in yours. This is the these are the values and what we see is that we have up to 42 joules, in this case 32, in this case 17. So depending on the uh, on the way that we define the final uh, tempering process, we can have a very good or high impact uh, property over the, uh, the steel. So having in mind all this, we select finally this one of there with uh, R8 that it will give us more or less thir uh, 35 joules of uh, resilient uh, property of joules. And if we go back, uh, an elongation about uh, 40 and uh, gear strength, uh, ultimate tensile strength about 1300 uh, megapascals and 1100 uh, megapascals for gear strength. Uh, we also make the residual strength determination, the same uh, results that uh, we have had before, and finally. We send uh, from SWG the, the analytic uh, die plates to Levario. We start the machining of the test of the die with all the operations, roll milling, milling, drip, drip drilling, and so on. So uh, the more uh, important thing is that there was no difference between the standard uh, machining of premium steels with this one. The only difference was 1.5% of more tool reading, but so I do think it's also an, a, a very few uh, percentage. We make some uh, welding uh, tests with uh, an H11 welding rod and also a 316 stainless steel, in this case for uh, not uh, for filling the uh, dice. What we make is also the we make the harness, we H10 harness. And what we observe is when we make the with the H11 road, uh, we have a good uh, transition between uh, the base material, the head uh, affected zone, and the welding zone. The yard difference between the microstructures and microstructures are quite good in all these uh, three areas. And we check, check for the hardness. So we check that in the uh, in the uh, intermediate uh, area, it was uh, an increased hardness, but with values of about up to 57 when we make the welding with the H11. So what we told us that it was a necessary uh, subsequent thermal treatment to, if we make a reparation with this H11 rod. And in the case of filling with uh, the stainless steel, uh, we see the difference between the base material, the uh, Head affected zone and the welding zone, as much they were different materials. The same uh, harness measurement, and here we have an area with very low uh, 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 harness uh, values, but this is common in filling materials for high pressure die casting uh, nice reparation. So, the conclusions. But we had development material uh, from SWG 
that it has not many problems to be machined. And the mechanical properties, we think they are uh, a good combination of mechanical and impact uh, uh, properties. So from this point, we went to the validation of the industrial scale and foundry at UEA. So we prepare a big Hyundai. We are speaking about uh, an injection uh, part of about 25 kilograms. So it's a very big part, uh, semi-structural part. And we make the starting part of the, of the die, the, the definition of these different points. There was also a definition of which are the parameters that they uh, should be taken from every, uh, every shift from the machine in order to have a control and also uh, compare properties and if there is any problem in the die to determine it, test rate, the ingestion of the registration, uh, thermal camera, composition of color and so on. Every uh, 51, uh, 10,000 injection, there is a deep control of the surface of the die and the problems over the, the part. Uh, I, I like in this case, is uh, when we make the uh, first 10,000 injections, it was in a slight wearing in the gate area. And we are making a comparison with the standard of the die that it has defined, defined uh, on the UOA for this die. This day, uh, we suppose in the initial that we have 100,000 injections, but re the reality is that it is only 90,000 injections. But we are making comparisons between the uh, real state of the, the new developed die with the new state with the standard life of the of, with premium steels. And we have made a comparison, LCC and LC calculation with the new data. The new data, uh, after uh, uh, 15,000 injections, we have an estimated uh, date life increase of about 60%. We must check, but um, by the moment we are very comfortable in this data. We have seen that it has been an increase in machining cost for the die of about 2%, but there has been also a decrease of two seconds in the cycle time of the, of the process because uh, there has been an increase in the thermal conductivity of the steel by the addition of the carbides and we have decreased the solidification time in the die. So the life cycle estimation, again, the same process, uh, the same energy consumption of materials is very similar, so it will grow quickly with that. But uh, if we update the data with 90% uh, more ingestion up to 160%, we have an increase on the, a decrease on the impact, environmental impact of the new steel. We can reduce, and it is very important, the number of the ties from 3.7 to 2.5 per year for the estimated uh, number of parts that it should be done at Fondery UEA. Uh, we have made also a narrow estimation of the cost for every step of the, of the, of the new process. Uh, there is an estimation of a, an overcost of 275 euros per ton for the new steel. A 1% of, of cost increase in the dye manufacturing, but there is a reduction estimation in the, in the life or in the cost, total industry cost of the uh, part of uh, with a reduction of uh, 30, 35% in every euro in, in every part that is made by the euro. So the total cost and the total reduce uh, the reduction uh, estimated over the all, overall manufacturing cost is about 25%. We have also made an estimation of exploitable results uh, with a new family of steel, new models for Ternalia for the simulation, a new industrial uh, process with reduced cost, and uh, but also more related with the with the new possibilities of new these uh, steels. So we see that they can be employed for other applications. For example, extrusion is a very similar approximation. Uh, uh, because they have very high temperature transformation temperatures with pressures and uh, forcing also of aluminium 
hot stamping, cold stamping, it will be another possibility. Hot and roll calling, where the wearing are very key points. Plastic ignition, not so much because plastic, plastic molds, uh, life is very high, but for a very special or uh, application of very special materials, it could be uh, sensible to employ these materials. Milling applications, Galdi, glass industry when we employ for very quality uh, glass products. And finally, uh, what we have here in speaking in this in this part is the, uh, that we think that we are covering with and um, improving the results of the project. So finally, we have also the examination events and workshop, which is the workshop, but they are going to be more presentation of results in Euro Woods 2020. In that is the best fair for high pressure die casting. Euro Woods Mexico also this year, it is going to be presented by Esta WP and by Levario. Uh, it is going to be a presentation in the Stat 2020 Congress and also the dissemination of our confidential results in the in the web. We are going to put all this information in the web and everyone can get the information from, from this web. So for me, for me, thank you very much, Ruol. And thank you very much. And now we are, we are I will pass the control to Patricia. And we are going to start with the questions. Thank you, Dr. Picario. Uh, I would like to remember that you will receive a survey about uh, our webinar as soon as we finish it. And if you have more questions that we can't have now, only we have 10 minutes to, to, to answer it, do you have emails in the screen and you could send us this email? So we have closed, uh, we have only 12 minutes for questions and so please um, I have uh, we have uh, I will pass you all the questions and, and so I have a question for Mr. Hoffman and the question is the same uh, they say that you have been talking about application and wear and abrasion what do you think will be the future application of this new material developed in HTRC steel project? Please, uh, I think, Ivan, can you answer this question, please? Okay, I think we have a uh, little about that, but uh, I think the, the process is where we have high temperatures, high pressures, um, high thermal. Uh, Stress in the die. They are more the, the best applications where we can employ this material. But for, for example, also, unless you can plus uh, another possibility. Yes. Okay. So I have other question for thank you uh, for Mrs. Sanchez. And the question I think is for you, Mr. Darberstein. Do you think if we increase the master alloy, we could increase properties? And from your point of view, talking about um, uh, the system to, from lab to, to industrial scale, what is the best system from your point of view to introduce the master alloy? Well, I think the question is for all of you, but okay. Maybe, okay, I will start to answer the question about the, the best uh, addition system. So, to, uh, finally, we came to the conclusion based on an industrial scale processing, the best is to use a continuous feeding system as we have implemented here at SWG. So, you have continuously to feed the master alloy during during remelting. If you <coughs> go and uh, would like to implement drilled holes in an electrode beforehand, uh, I think it is too uh, time consuming and uh, it also like the, we will see like um, extra machining costs. So to my point of view, only feeding system will be feasible. 
Yeah, thank you. And uh, we have uh, other question talking about microstructure. So I think it's time of, for you, Mr. Hans. What is the advantage of this material from the point of view of the microstructure? Thinking about the microstructure. There is a problem with, uh, the, with, your, with your microphone, uh, Alice. We cannot hear you. Yes, I think so. Okay, I will try to, to answer because we cannot hear Alice. Uh, the first thing I think uh, the microstructure change uh, is involved with the uh, Synthetic particles. Uh, These synthetic particles have the, the main uh, effect over the green uh, refining of the steel because, because they add as nucleic agents and we check that normally they are uh, seated inside the grain. So, in that way, we can improve the mechanical properties because if these uh, particles will be. In the, in the green border, we will have problems with the, with the quality that we can obtain or, or they are not so good. So we can have two problems. One is agglomeration, we will have agglomerated particles. Uh, we decrease the, the properties. And if we are capable of obtaining uh, a smaller grain size, as uh, Alex has told, that we uh, pass from a seven to uh, an eight, degree in SATM process, we increase the quality of the part. So I think that this is the key point. To have uh, some particles that they are capable of getting inside the grains, nuclei as nucleated agents, and promoting the refining of the steel. Uh, sorry, Patricia, we cannot hear you. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, I was talking that I will be fast because we have a couple of more questions. Um, from John Kubrick, he asked about the uh, uh, where can our two makers in Europe purchase this steel for HPDC dice? Two makers in Europe purchase about this steel. Where can our two makers? Do you know? Uh, Patricia, I have, Hello, have a you connection, me? connection issue. Uh, Could you please report, uh, please again? Uh, so, I, as I yes, understand, no, I where, where to buy this new steel, or what was the question about? The question is about two makers in Europe. Part of this is the, that could be buy this this material. Okay, so I, I think that the, the current. Oh, Alexander, so we can, uh, so actually it is not a problem. If there, is, if there are tool makers and we would like to participate in this new steel grade, they contact, they can directly contact, uh, for example, Technaria or SWG plant uh, to handle and to discuss um, all details. So it is possible to get this new steel grade out of SWG, for example. Okay, thank you. Um, other question from Amaya Igartua, Technica. She likes to know if you will have recorded the presentation and if you could be able for register participants. And another question is, will you have planned to present, if we have planned to present a follow-up uh, follow proposal? Um, so, if we, because they are working in music project. And so that, that is this question from Amaya.
Okay. Uh, so in, the, in the first point, I think uh, we are, uh, we are uh, talking about uh, continuing the project, but we are not defined yet because we should define which one are the applications, final applications where we want to do that. And the first question was about uh, the recording of the webinar, the, the webinar is recording. And all the people that they have been uh, in this webinar, they are going to have the possibility of the, the, the presentation for about six days. So they are going to have a link where they can get the presentation. Okay, and um, so yes, it's 12.27, uh, so it's time to close. And we have the last question. And the question comes from Powell Malinowski. And the question is, have you tried predict mechanical properties of the alloy using different chemical properties and thermal treatment parameters? Okay, uh, we have uh, defined, when well, we define the, the matrix, the Taguchi matrix, we were focused only in the composition of the material because uh, we wanted to know the, the effect of the allogen element and we wanted to know how to establish and we have to establish uh, a fixed tempering and quenching temperatures for all the alloys. We know it, they can change a lot because after we're working with these alloys, uh, depending on the composition, it changes the tempering and more the, uh, than the quenching temperature. So quenching temperature, they can be more stable, but the, uh, tempering temperature, they should be studied for every uh, composition. So we have to do that because we think, we think should be done once to have a family or a determined uh, composition. Sorry. And, 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 the, and the work is huge. I mean, we have to do many, many things, to uh, many trials to go ahead with this kind of, of materials. But it will be a very good uh, continuation of the project. I don't know what you think about that. that. Okay. Yes, uh, we think we should uh, really continue about this project, for sure. Yes, sir, we think we should really continue about this project. I think so. Um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the last question was in relation of the from Mariano, but I, I lost the question at the moment. Uh, Mariano has a question about uh, how we, the, if we use learning system to make the trials. So, Patricia, can you repeat the question, please? It was not possible for us to understand the question. Thank you. I'm uh, sorry. Sorry. That Sorry, I, I am looking for a question because the last question is was about the when broken. The question is from you see uh, one is uh, if we use uh, UC machine learning or deep learning if we have been used this, and the last one is the question is when there is a broken area in the die, is this still compatible with other steel alloys when we need to weld them together? I think for welding repairment, Ivan should answer the question. I think so. Please, sorry, Ivan. I, do you, I can listen to you. Can you hear me? Yes, now, yes. Please. Okay. Uh, we have to make the trials with the, our base material, with the enforcement particles, and we have to employ the standard H11 uh, rod. Uh, we think that these materials are compatible because the number of uh, 
o te torchen te echan de reinforcing carbon that the fast improvements in the steam is not so huge. So we think it's quite compatible with other steams. So uh, one of the lines that we wanted also to study is if we employ, for example, laser melting, what happens with the material? So there will be the same material that we are employing in the steam. But we are we, we are combining two different materials. We don't think we, we have a, any problem because these carbides are in the same range. This is the first point, and the composition of cars are very similar. We are speaking about the uh, H11. Thank you. Um, I think that we have finished this round of questions. But I want to remember again that you will receive a survey about our webinar. That if you have any question, particular question, you can send us by email that we have now in the screen. And only I, I want to say thank you to the audience. Thank you to the presentation. And I hope our HTD still have a long, long future and long, long time. Thank you. I see. I see you as soon as possible. Thank you. Bye bye. We close this. Finish our. Thank you all. Thank you to the audience. Bye. Thank you. Thank you to all. <laughs>